coming up. What an excellent day for middle names. Well, howdy folks, and welcome to Minute 105 of The Exorcist Minute, a show where we endeavor to examine, extrapolate, and excavate The Exorcist, minute by terrifying minute. My name is Lester Ryan Michael Clark. And I'm Keenan Kauanoe Okalani Diaz. Oh, oh you, had to, you, had to, you had to show that your name was longer than mine, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, that's just the truth, though. Yeah. Sorry, I had to. Them's the facts. All right. Should have, should have been Hawaiian mm-hmm. if you wanted to. Yeah. Well, folks, everyone knows it's not about length, you know? It's, it's a... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we'll be your holy guides on this journey through what some have called the scariest movie of all time. Okay, so our minute begins with Marin saying, What is your daughter's middle name, Mrs. McNeil? And it ends with Marin sprinkling Dimmy with holy water. Yes, folks, it has finally begun, but before we go through that door in the movie, let's go through it in the book. Here we go. A reading from the Book of Blatty. At the door of the room, the Jesuits stopped. Karis frowned at the sweater and jacket Chris wore. You're coming in? You think I shouldn't? Please don't, Karis urged her. Don't. You'd be making a big mistake. Chris turned questioningly to Marin. Father Karis knows best, said the exorcist quietly. Chris looked to Karis again, dropped her head. Okay, she said despondently. She leaned her back against the wall. I'll wait out here. What is your daughter's middle name, Mrs. McNeil? Marin asked. It's Teresa. What a lovely name, the old priest said warmly. He held Chris's gaze for a moment, reassuringly, and when he turned his head and looked at the door to Reagan's room, Chris again felt that tension, that thickening of coiled darkness behind it, in the bedroom, beyond the door. Marin nodded. All right, he said softly. Karis opened the door and almost reeled back from the blast of stench and icy cold. In a corner of the room, bundled up in a faded green sheepskin hunting jacket, Carl sat huddled in a chair. He turned expectantly to Karis, who had quickly flicked his glance to the demon in the bed. Its gleaming eyes stared beyond him to the hall. They were fixed on Marin. Karis moved forward to the foot of the bed while Marin, tall and erect, walked slowly to the side, where he stopped and stared down into hate. And now... A smothering stillness hung over the bedroom. Then Reagan licked a wolfish, blackened tongue across her cracked and swollen lips. It sounded like a hand smoothing crumpled parchment. Well, proud scum, the demon voice croaked. At last, at last you've come. The old priest lifted his hand and traced the sign of the cross above the bed, and then repeated the gesture toward all in the room. Turning back, he plucked the cap from the vial of holy water. Ah, yes, the holy urine now, the demonic voice rasped, the semen of the saints. Marin lifted up the vial, and the demonic face grew livid and contorted as the voice seethed. Ah, will you, bastard, will you? Marin started shooting holy water sprinkles, and the demon jerked its head up, the mouth and the neck muscles trembling with rage. Yes, yes, sprinkle, sprinkle, Marin, drench us, drown us in your sweat. Your sweat is sanctified, Saint Marin. Bend and fart out clouds of incense. Bend and show us the holy rump that we may worship and adore it, Marin. Kiss it, make it be silent. The words were flung like thunderbolts. Karis flinched and jerked his head around in wonder at Marin, now staring commandingly at Regan. And the demon was silent, was returning his stare. But the eyes were now hesitant, blinking, wary. All right. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So what do we make of this? What do we make of this uh, this little bit here? Yes, this has begun, huh? It gets, gets, it gets right in there mm-hmm. <laughs> right as soon as it starts. Uh, and that's similar to how the movie is. I, I was reviewing the minutes for, for what we're recording, and uh, I just kept watching. I was like, oh, it just doesn't, doesn't stop. You know, it just keeps, yeah. keeps reeling in. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I guess there are a couple big changes, right? So yes. um, Chris wanting to come into the room and and being told that she can't. Right. Which is done in the movie, as we'll see, just wordlessly. Right. Mm-hmm. But then we scenify it here in the book. Uh, what do you think yes. about that? That's interesting. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I, I, keep, I cannot not think about hashtag not my Chris's patriarchy line now. 
<laughs> yeah, they're a little more, pa- but it's mm-hmm. not the, pa- but it's not, they're not doing it because of the patriarchy in the book right. either, but, it, but they are like having that conversation. Yes. And, and she's been kept out specifically where in the movie, she, she's not kept out specifically. They right. just close the door on her and she can't, you know, she, it's not very, it's not clear. Like she's not unambiguous saying like, I, I need to be in there. This is my daughter. Right. Right. And we'll talk about that expression on her face in the movie right. uh, when we get there. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, that part of the book, it, there's there's a part earlier where Karis says to Chris, he gives her advice. He says, like, while this is going on, try to avoid contact with Reagan because mm-hmm. you interacting with her in this state is going to – might cause uh, permanent damage to your relationship. Wow, yeah. Um, because you're not going to like, even, you know, even if we get the demon, even if we, you know, if we completely fix her, mm-hmm. you might have like something in your lizard brain whenever you, whenever you look at her. So mm-hmm. like, you don't want that. So like, maybe, maybe it's best to stay away until she gets better. Um, mm-hmm. and I don't know how I feel about even that advice in the book. Um, but I can see how that line from Karis earlier and this line from him here, it's like, you really shouldn't go in there. Um, comes from the same place. Yeah, because she's gonna she's gonna become less Reagan uh, before she becomes more Reagan, right? Right. right. Yeah. It's gonna get worse before it gets better. Right, and really, really badly. Um, and yeah, as we'll see in the movie, right, it, it, uh, the demon's really lashing out. The more that it's mm. in a corner, it's getting its behavior is much worse, and its psychological behavior, like its psychological right. torture, is even worse than, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> than anything else. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that kind of reminds me. So I had a mentor once who um, was explaining when his father had passed away, even a couple decades before. This is one of my mm. professors. And and mm. he said, you know, they told me I shouldn't eulogize my father at the funeral, that it's just too emotional of experience and that I shouldn't mm. do that. And it's your time to sort of just sit in the pew, right, and listen mm. to other people eulogize them. And he he didn't. He went and did the eulogy anyways. And he uh. he's still, you know, decades later, wasn't sure, you know, if, if, if that was the right decision or not. Hmm. Hmm. And I guess the torture of that is if he hadn't, mm-hmm. he'd still be not sure. That's a good point. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. That's a really and good point. And probably feel even worse. I mean, right. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's a, mm. that, that is, that is one of those tough questions. Ugh. Yeah. But then, um, you know, another friend of mine got taken to the hospital and rushed mm-hmm. into surgery and they took him up to the surgeon and, and yeah. the surgeon said, I, I can't operate on on this boy. Uh, mm-hmm. He's my son. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, what do you think about that? <laughs> I mean, you know what? Uh-huh. <laughs> did did that surgeon make the right choice? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> See, folks, that wasn't me. <laughs> I was wondering where the lady doctor was in all of this. We we kind of we kind of lost her in the the lady doctor. In our, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was wondering where the doctor. <laughs> That's right. Jesus Christ! I still, even when I'm talking about it, I I still can't do it. That's the, the wrong patriarchy, with Lester. That is. It is. Oh, it is. Ah. Oh. That, that patriarchy keeping that lady doctor from operating on her own son. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can no more fly from the patriarchy than I can fly from myself. <laughs> to quote John Milton in our bonus episodes. <laughs> Ugh. Ah. Great. Yeah. So what else about these changes with the, this minute and this uh, beginning of this chapter? So let's see. Um, yeah, I don't know why Carl's in there. He had to use the bathroom. <laughs> 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 but yeah, like we, we we talked about this on the um on on the other episode. I think it was uh, like like um off the air, or maybe it was like I put it in as a bonus mm-hmm. thing or something like that. But like it just like it's it's hard not to laugh when you know you're 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 right outside the door. Uh huh. This is the door in this movie, right. Kenan. And beyond that door is the final boss. This is mm-hmm. this is you know Reagan slash Howdy, and these two priests are going to go in there. Like supposedly alone, like anyone mm-hmm. would think they're gonna go in there alone, right? <laughs> but you open the door, right? And you mm-hmm. turn, and in a corner of the room is freaking Bernie Sanders <laughs> in his little mittens and his and his like fleece coat 
and his little hat with the ear flaps. <laughs> right. And he's very all bundled up. There. Yeah, well, yeah, it's very cold. And he just looks at you with surprise because he because he notices movement, so he just does a quick jerk to the door. <laughs> right. So his vision is based on movement. Right? Yes. <laughs> I'm like, come on, like, don't, why, why is he in the room? Get him out of the room. He's straightening the pictures. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like we need to work on the renovation. <laughs> Cause his, you know, after this exorcism is done, he doesn't get a vacation or anything. No, 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 no. no. He has yeah. a lot of work to do. Yeah. So. He's got to, got to cleaning up both physically, mentally and emotionally. <laughs> right. He's yeah. measuring. Yeah. The drapes. Cause they've all been ripped. He's measuring mm. what, what, what drapes they need. Oh yeah. That's a good, that is a good point. <laughs> Who's going to clean up after all of this? Carl. Yeah. Hey, Willie. <laughs> That's why Willie's not there outside the door. Right. She 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 smelled what was up and she skedaddled. <laughs> She's on her own road trip. We were joking about like Carl having a road trip back home, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> mm. But yeah. Um but yeah, and then uh the the other thing that stood out to me mm-hmm. was the snarkiness of Howdy. How he is um, a little bit more. He's he's still trying to play games uh-huh. uh, with Marin. He's he's being as offensive as possible. Right, right. now he's mixing like potty humor with um you know with with church stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh and, but what I really really like is now whenever he like in the book from this point on whenever he refers to uh Marin he calls him Saint Marin. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a little dig at Marin's former sin, which is pride. Mm-hmm. Um. And yeah, so so I I like that part, um, but at the same time, I can see why Friedkin decided not to have those in the movie, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in this episode. Cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's get back to the top of this minute here. We are back outside that room, but not for long. We are also still looking at Chris's desperate, pleading, childlike face, but not for long. As just like Father Marin, Damien now moves in front of the camera, obscuring Chris from us. Remember, folks, I said that in the last minute how uh, uh, Chris's face was revealed to us by Marin moving out of frame, like he chased the darkness away. Now, in this minute, darkness briefly returns as Dimmy follows Marin into the frame, and that's where we cut, and we are now looking over Chris's shoulder at Marin. Mm-hmm. There's a pause. Uh, perhaps Marin is trying to make the next words as painless as possible. And then he asks, what is your daughter's middle name, Mrs. McNeil? Now, first time watching this, um, I don't think I knew why he asked that. Um, Keenan, can you remember something clicking here when, when you first watched this? Catholic. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's just very Catholic. I it's think a very Catholic know thing this. We got. Yeah, it's a Catholic AF in this movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I think we need to know her middle name. Yeah, that yeah. that, that that's always made sense to me. So that that's yeah. interesting that uh, um, what it uh, caught you off guard to ask for the middle name. Or... Well, I just didn't like like it's something that I never even considered. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, maybe because like growing up, just like everybody I knew had a middle name. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's because growing up, everybody I knew was Catholic. Kind of <laughs> now, so that could have been it, and I just didn't even notice. You know, right, right. My right. my worldview was was very very small back then, <laughs> as was I. Um, oh, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but no, yeah. So so you know, you're right. This is this is a Catholic thing. He's like, in case in case you you hadn't realized, Mister Neil. <laughs> well, I don't think it's like. What is your daughter's middle name? You know, for the tombstone. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding you. I'm just busting your jobs. <laughs> Everything's wow. going to be fine. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. I wasn't even going to go there. Oh, my God. Lighten mm. up in here. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> he looks around. He's like, tough room. <laughs> I thought the real challenge was going to be in there, but boy, this is like a, like an oil painting. It's like a like a like a like a like the Last Supper over here. <laughs> nah. But yeah, when this thing comes back in the movie, this middle name thing, it is it is really really powerful, both literally and figuratively. Mm-hmm. Um, even now, like when I know why he's doing it, it it still hits me when it when it comes up again in the middle of the exorcism i'm like oh Mm -hmm. that's her full name she has she has a full name it's like like i i don't want to say it's like a punchline but it's like it's a type of callback that like almost makes you want to cry 
Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Mm. It's like like him honoring her full name is just, uh, it's almost too much, right? Yeah, like what, giving her more of a person because Howdy yes. has been taking away her person? That, yeah, that's exactly it. It's 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 like, this This is Reagan Teresa McNeil. Like, how mm-hmm. dare you, right? Right, yeah. Yeah. I like that. Mm. But yeah, so he's asking this for for two reasons. One is for the ritual, right? It's it's to gain power. Uh, remember, folks, there there are some versions of exorcism where knowing the name of the demon gives the exorcist power over that demon. Mm-hmm. But here, it's it's a little different. Um, in asking for Reagan's full name, he's not you know, trying to gain power over her per se. Right. Um, it's still over the demon. He is reminding Howdy that Reagan does not belong to him. Her middle name is something that existed before he showed up. It was given to Reagan by someone who loves her. That is a bond of love that Howdy cannot break. Reagan has been named. Mm -hmm. Folks, we're covering Paradise Lost in the bonus feed, and we just got to the part with Adam and Eve, and we talk about how both Adam and Eve are like God in their own unique ways. And remember, even outside of Milton, Adam is known for giving everything in the garden a name. And in this way, he is doing a, a version of what God does, like in small scale, right? God creates something out of nothing. He gives it shape, and Adam gives it a name. Mm-hmm. Um, Eve is the same way. She can actually create life uh, like God. Um, and like God, her, her love has the ability to make things better than they were. And here, Chris is the single parent, and she is doing both of these things for Reagan. She has given birth to Reagan, given her life, given her breath. And yeah, we don't know who gave her the middle name, but mm-hmm. Chris has held on to it this whole time. She has cherished it. Reagan doesn't have a stage name. I get the mm-hmm. feeling uh, Chris doesn't want that life for her. She wants her to have a better, happier life, a normal life. And for that reason, she also probably keeps Reagan's middle name a secret, keeps it out of the papers, out of the, the tabloids. This is Reagan's name. They can't have that. They don't get to know it. And it is something that she and Reagan share. It's a secret and a bond that they have. So we gave them our middle names at the beginning of this episode. Is that mm-hmm. going to be a problem for us later on? I mean, you know, if, if anybody wants to, like, you know, exercise us, um, <laughs> you know. Or send it to the, yeah, call TMZ and say, you'll never guess what Lester Clark's middle oh, name yeah, is. Oh, yeah, right. You'll never guess what Keenan Diaz's middle name is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, like, I'll never guess who Lester Clark is. <laughs> yeah. <It's> like, who? <laughs> oh, you mean Lester Ryan Michael Clark the third? <laughs> But yeah, um, so so that's one reason uh, that that he's doing this. He's asking for the middle name. Um, secondly, by asking for Reagan's middle name, Marin might also be attempting to reestablish Reagan's identity separate from the demon that has right. been uh, plaguing this family for months. Right? Howdy has been trying to. Uh, drive and tear the family apart. His goal is for Chris to give up on her own daughter, for the family to forsake her, for Karis to walk away knowing that, wow, deep down, love really doesn't conquer all, right? Love is love is just as much a lie as God. Mm-hmm. So that's what Howdy is trying to do. And by Marin reestablishing that Reagan has a middle name, that she is a whole person that is loved, right? That is that is uh, chipping away at that uh, at that illusion that Howdy is playing with. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's also Marin is also subtly reminding everyone that they are not fighting Reagan. And we'll see visual reminders of this in the exorcism itself when they are tending to her, when they are cleaning up the vomit or giving her medicine uh, in the book. Yeah, so I think that's interesting, right? In the previous minute, it's Damien. Uh, who's trying to say like, hey, Reagan has three different personalities. Right. And Marin says, no, there is only one demon is implied. And then right. here, as he comes up here, he's separating the demon from Reagan in a way that right. Damien, none of them have done. Right. right I mean, exactly. there's, there's sort of like nothing conscious. Right. So like previously, uh, Carl says like, it wants no straps. Right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you, can you say that again? <laughs> it wants no straps. I, yeah, I, it, I think I got no. <laughs> yeah. It wants no straps. Right. Right. So they're, they're, I think, subconsciously doing it. But now Marin is trying to do that, uh, you know, consciously that to separate the demon from, yes. from Reagan. Yeah. These are two different people in the same body right and maybe they're not like equipped to uh to to hold that in their heads right like maybe that's just too big of a concept right so even though carl is saying it and maybe we don't know maybe the other members of the household are are trying to do that as well it's like Mm -hmm. one of those things it's like it's like you know it in your head but then you know you also have like you know a knowing in your heart and they can't they can't um you know uh make both of those uh 
coincide, right? Yeah, can you imagine can. that? Like we need to we need to change Reagan's underpants because she's wetting the bed, right? Mm, yeah. But then also say that that's not Reagan. This right. is a demon, but we also have to feed Reagan and make sure she's warm and all these mm-hmm. right. <laughs> like how can you attack it and yeah. and take care of her right. right and so so that i mean I, that seems impossible to me right. but yeah um so Marin is doing that work for them finally like finally exactly. someone's like able to come in and cut through this and say like no exactly yeah yeah um so yeah so so now we hold on Marin as chris answers she says teresa mm-hmm. um that is reagan's middle name mm-hmm. reagan teresa mcneil and i think for most people that name is is going to ring some um not some alarm bells, uh, some church bells, right? <laughs> right. Um, but no, I, th- I think that is a name even now that has uh, deep religious uh, connections. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no Teresa in the Bible, but there are several saints with that name. Uh, most popular of whom is, you know, St. Uh, Teresa of uh, Calcutta, better known as Mother Teresa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was trying to see because yeah, that's exactly where my mind went, and I was trying yeah. to see like, okay, well, how well known was she then? By the time we right. were kids, mm-hmm. um, that that name, uh, Mother Teresa, was just like synonymous with goodness and saintlyhood. So right, right. you would Someone, say that if, like, oh, go ahead. You think you're oh, going to no, say no, the same no, thing? You, I'm I think say. you were going to. No, you, you, you say. It, you say. <laughs> no, I think you were going to say the same thing. I was oh, no, 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 no. You go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. If we were like making fun of you for being a goody two shoes, you would say like, oh, Lester's Mother Teresa over here. Right, right? Right, right. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. it, was, it was like, yeah, that was. Um... Which was exactly planned with what we did. See how I like accidentally stepped over him. And then I was like, no, no, after you, after you. See? <laughs> so that way I get to call you Mother Teresa. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> I oh, see yeah. your master plan here. <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to see how well known she would have been. And apparently, Mm. um, as Blatty is writing the book, right, in like late 1969 and the early 1970, et cetera. um, Yeah, that was when Mother Teresa was becoming a really big deal internationally. Uh So there was a BBC documentary in 1969, and then um, that became a book. So yeah, that would have been the time where people in the West would start knowing Mother Teresa and hear about her saintliness. Interesting. Okay. Hmm. Now, the name itself is believed to have Greek origins, uh, possibly derived from the Greek uh, word uh, terezine, uh, meaning to harvest. Um, interesting, just like this, that, you know, we got another Greek uh, echo here. Mm-hmm. Um, another theory suggests it might come from the Greek island of Terra in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, but this is less certain. Um, Keenan, what do we think of this name in this story, like like both the name itself and also it being revealed to us this late in the movie. It does it does read Catholic, right? So that's yeah. very interesting, you know, because everything we know about Chris and, and Reagan. So it's nice to have that surprise. Like, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, there were all these plans or or pressure to name her, you know, something saintly like uh, or something right. that that has the connotation of something, you know, older and uh, mm. more traditional than, you know, Reagan. I mean, Reagan, I guess, is yeah. an older name, but but that wasn't common that g- little girls would be named Reagan there, right? Right, right. But she gives a, a traditionally feminine and older name for, for Reagan. And yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's just a fascinating little peek into it. And yeah, so it's not like, uh, you know, we know her middle name at the beginning, and we're like, why do we know this character's middle it's name? Awesome. Something's going to come of it. This, <laughs> yeah, is, exactly. this is Chekhov Teresa Schrodinger's <laughs> middle name. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Something's going to happen. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I like that we we get it here late. Like Chris, yeah. I mean, obviously Chris knows her doll's middle, middle name, but she doesn't yeah. like go around telling everybody that. She's not exactly crazy on a podcast giving out her personal information. No, no, no. Right. <laughs> Social security number. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 865 <laughs> 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 um, But yeah, so. We know that Chris is an atheist. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't know about Howard. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. For for them to pick this name from from these context clues in the book, Mm -hmm. I suspect Chris chose the name Reagan from King Lear. Right. Absolutely. Um, She jokes about how she almost named her Goneril, right, which is the other daughter, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, g- thank God <laughs> she didn't right. go with Goneril. Yeah, or, yeah. or or that would have just become a common little girl's name now, and we'd have oh, Goneril's boy. running around. Yeah. Goneril's, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then Reagan yeah. would be the weird name for us. Right, right. <laughs> um, so, and, and I checked, and there are a couple of literary Teresas mm. that she could have been picking from. 
There's one from Don Quixote. Um, there's one in The Sun Also Rises by Hemingway. And there's one in uh, Island Beneath the Sea. So if it was Chris, she might have got it from one of those, right? She's She picked a, a Shakespeare name for Reagan's first name. And maybe, you know, she got, you know, another character from another book for Teresa. Oh, that's interesting. And I think of Maria Teresa of Austria. Mm. She was like one of the most powerful um, rulers in history because she was ah, yeah. like, I'm sorry, one of the most powerful female rulers by far, mm. for sure, mm-hmm. uh, because she ran the Habsburgs, which at that point was like Austria and like most of uh, Southwestern or Southeastern Wait a minute, Europe. wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? So I'm not allowed to say lady doctor? <laughs> I'm saying that she was certainly one of the most important, like the, she certainly had the most power, uh, uh, the more power. Now I'm all tongue tied. <laughs> <laughs> she certainly was a super important empress. Right. Or, okay. Yeah. But, but like if, when you, when you like go back and list like the powerful Queens of all time, like she's uh-huh. definitely like in the top like five you yeah, know, ever. Yeah. Yes. 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 So it's like her, Catherine, the great Elizabeth, the great um, Isabella of, um, of Aragon. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like uh, Isabel of Castile and Aragon. You got me all tongue tied here. <laughs> 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 she's a lady empress. <laughs> yes. As opposed to to a male empress. <laughs> to a male empress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, look her up. She was she was yeah, like so powerful because Austria and all of mm-hmm. her um all of her kingdoms were all over the like in the Netherlands. She was ruler of the Netherlands and like a huge chunk of Europe was under Maria Theresa. Right, right. And she gave she gave a you know a couple of emperors uh, a run for their money as well. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. But I wonder, I hadn't thought about the Howard thing. I mean, you know, it's not uncommon, I think, you know, for if one parent to be like, oh, okay, we have a couple of different names, uh, so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to pick the, you know, I'm, I'm going to put my foot down for the, the first name and we can go right. through the, the middle name. So maybe that is Howard um, peeking in there. Yeah. And also for us to not know what religion Howard was. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, he's not... <sighs> He's not a character. Like he doesn't exist. Like he right. like like Blatty didn't write him in the book, and and he's not in the movie. Like he's he's like a picture of somebody on on Reagan's desk. So mm-hmm. like there's there's no character to examine. But it got me thinking about mixed marriages in terms of religion, mm-hmm. right? So I mean this this story is coming out when divorce is still a taboo subject, mm-hmm. and we have Chris being. Um, a, a divorcee and Reagan being a child of divorce. Right. And I'm wondering, like, what was what was the attitude of mixed religions in marriage during this time? Certainly not um, not something that you would expect to have happened. Yeah. So uh, mm. just a little, you know, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but other literature at the time, like, are you mm. there? It's uh, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. That's right. about a mixed religious family, and mm. and so what they decide to do is they ask uh, Margaret to, you know, they're trying to do the right hippy dippy thing, and they're like, we're not going to make you decide what religion you want to be, honey. Right? It right, all right. sounds good, but then Margaret's growing up, and she's whatever. She's like twelve, and she's like, I just need you to tell me what religion I should yeah. be, and it, like you're actually making it more, co- you know, whatever you try mm-hmm. to do for your kids, right? You can't make it perfect. No, no, so no. so Margaret goes goes crazy during the course of that book, right? Trying to figure mm. out like what she should do and what her relationship with God is, and as right. she's praying to god like what do i even call you because it's all right. different yeah yeah yeah. Mm, yeah and so yeah so that, that just just a fun little think piece of mm-hmm. you know like like you know on this character whom whom we never see but we you know and and we never even hear from because he doesn't even doesn't even call on his daughter's birthday yeah sheesh um, don't don't blame whatever religion you assume howard is uh for that yeah he's just yeah, a yeah, jerk yeah. yeah he's just a jerk <laughs> yeah Good riddance. Um, <laughs> what a Catholic stereotype. You don't call your daughter on her <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> on her birthday. What a Catholic thing to do. <laughs> Sorry, babe. I just I I uh, I'm I'm busy with uh, church. <laughs> <laughs> right, catechisms and such. Yeah, I got a communion at two thirty. Uh, you know, and then a confession and uh, you know. Oh, my communion was so long today, babe. I'm sorry. There are two accidents. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, you got the morning communion and it's rush hour. All right. And the other way, everyone's heading the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same line and it's like, you know, it's like we're all going in the same place, everyone. Come on. Hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then I get up there and, uh, you know, um, and, and 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 the priest, uh, he's he's like, 
Do you know how fast you were going back there? <laughs> In life? <laughs> you need to slow down. <laughs> That's anyway. great. Yeah. Uh, uh, highway to hell. There. <laughs> <laughs> Something about that. Right. Just, you know. But yeah, so all that stuff about, about this name, we... And we can't ignore the Catholic undertones here, like you mm-hmm. said, Keenan. Um, this is a conscious recalling of that by the film. And I remember when I first saw this, I had this just like lizard brain thought, like, like, oh, that's good. That will help her. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the intention, like placing it here, like the name of a saint right outside the gates of hell. Right. But – yeah, I was like, it, it was such a, it's such a like half baked, unformed thought, right? It's mm-hmm. like, oh, this, that's good, right? It's like, why, why is it good? I don't know. Yeah, mm-hmm. like if if her name was if her name was Allison, we would we'd be like, oh no, you picked the wrong middle name, right. girl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you done fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> what is your daughter's middle name, Mrs. McNeil? Reagan Morningstar. <laughs> McNeil. <laughs> Morning Star Lucifera. Yeah. <laughs> Alistair <that's> Crowley. <laughs> the 666. <laughs> that's when Marin's just like, I, I, I thank you for your time. And just, <laughs> just turns. <laughs> like, this is going to be too hard. Yeah. <laughs> And you know what? In this shot where she's telling her uh, daughter's middle name, Teresa, you've been talking yeah. in the past few minutes about how young everyone else looks when in the presence of Marin, which I think is really cool. And yeah. here she looks so small, right? Because mm. she's uh, she's got this giant coat on, like this big fur coat, like right. probably literally the warmest thing that she owns. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And in the script, it's called out that Chris and Sharon are bundled in sweaters. Um, mm. But so then when we make it to the movie, let's it's like, OK, let's pick up on that and go even further right like the right. warmest thing that they could wear yeah, um that, yeah. that possible so she looks just a teeny tiny woman here under this giant fur coat she looks yeah, like yeah. justin bieber's monkey if you've seen that <laughs> <laughs> do you we're know not, that do you know like, that particular monkey size comparison folks not like not anything else <laughs> oh in, in the little coat yes yes yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like a macaque that justin bieber left at ikea in in toronto or something oh jesus you don't know this one no, no. I <laughs> all right, all right. So just so you don't think I'm picking on, uh-huh. <laughs> I'm picking on. I'll just send this, uh, okay. send this monkey to you. Hold on, please. Hold all right. On. That is, believe it or not, the third time Keenan has said that sentence to me <laughs> in our relationship. I texted it to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's what oh, Chris really? reminds me of. That is that is, <laughs> that is Chris McNeil right there. <laughs> okay, great. And I guess I'm conflating Justin Bieber's monkey that he left behind and um and the IKEA monkey. Those are two different monkeys. I apologize. Oh, okay, but, okay. But yes, Justin Bieber left a monkey behind in some country and then they wouldn't give it back. Oh, geez, like like <laughs> he left it behind like accidentally, like when he was on tour. Yeah, and then he, I, I, something like he, oh. he assumed he can get his monkey back, and then they were like, no, you can't just have a monkey, yeah. <laughs> even though you're Justin Bieber. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Animal rights group begs Justin Bieber not to get another monkey. <laughs> 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 it's a real Vanity Fair article wow. headline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he brought it to Germany, and then uh-huh. Germany was like, "You can't have a monkey." And he was uh-huh. like, "But, but I'm Bieber." <laughs> 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 so they confiscated it. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Well, there you go, folks. Mm-hmm. Don't don't bring your monkey over foreign waters. <laughs> you heard it first here on the yeah. Exodus Minute. <laughs> Leave your monkey at home. <laughs> That's what gets us uh, a loss in listenership. All of a sudden, like I don't come on podcast to be told what to do with my monkey. Yeah. I don't know who these. <laughs> These liberal West Coast <laughs> monkey hating <laughs> bastards are. <laughs> anyway, um, she looks like a monkey. <laughs> yes, is what we're saying. In, in specifically, Justin Bieber's little monkey in that big coat. Jeez. All right. But yeah. Um, now, uh, so we we hold on Marin for a while, mm-hmm. 
even after she gives him uh, her daughter's middle name. Mm -hmm. And looking at his face, the phrase that came to my mind was caring stone. Mm -hmm. if, a, if a statue had a heart. Uh, I, I believe Blatty describes him at one point as an alabaster statue, mm -hmm. um, speaking of saints. And I feel like before coming up here, he has composed himself for the coming battle. He has donned the stone mantle of exorcist. Mm -hmm. uh, but because he is Marin, he cannot or will not hide his love. And this here, then, is like a mirror of that corrupted statue, that Virgin Mary statue. Remember before, we thought that those like ugly appendages had sprouted from inside the statue. Mm -hmm. um, and here, it's like Marin's humanity and his love for his fellow man is breaking through the stone from mm -hmm. the inside. Um, and, and so he says, what a lovely name. And he even smiles a little. It's, it's very subtle, but again, it's just this tiny little crack in the stone. Um, and we cut to Chris, and we can see that, that just his words and that little smile have a profound effect on her. She, she was probably expecting just to, you know, return Marin's smile, right? Maybe thank him. But the flood of emotion at the praise and validation of her daughter's name is almost too much. And Keenan, this might be the best on-camera representation of crying that I have seen. And it's because it's not a cry. It's almost a cry. Mm -hmm. And she has to do everything in her power to pull back from the edge. You can see it almost happening. She struggles and then lets it out in this like trembling sigh that I would never be able to artificially create. Right. Yeah. And remember, folks, like like we talked about actors being able to like, uh, you know, some of them being able to cry on cue and how that's not what happens in real life at all. Like we're, we're so ready to showcase our tears on stage or in front of the camera. But in real life, we often do the exact opposite. We try as hard as we can not to show our emotions, our uh, vulnerability, even in situations where it is socially OK to do so, like funerals or like right now, we still don't want to show that side of ourselves. And for that reason, I really love Ellen Burstyn's acting right here. And it also goes against all the parodies that she's, you know, hysterical. Even now, she's trying to be strong for rag trying to be strong for these priests and trying to be strong in the face of the enemy who, if he's not aware of this little exchange, he is aware of how this is affecting Chris. Yeah, I've, heard, I've learned recently, so some sometime between the last time we talked about this idea of mm -hmm. like suppressing um, cries, uh, is that what's going on physiologically is that uh -huh. when you're when you are crying, you uh -huh. um, are so disturbed usually that you um, are going through your flight or fight mechanisms in your body. Okay. And then you are trying to um, hold back your crying, right? Mm -hmm. So you're like fighting with your body you know, as your body is mm -hmm. fighting with you and having this, that, that makes your like, yeah. your, you know, you get a lump in your throat, right? When you're mm -hmm. trying to cry. And what that is, is like you you're you trying to psychologically override your your flight or fight responses in order right, to yeah because right. your flight or fight responses is trying to open up your airwaves to get more oxygen to you and you ah. at the same time are saying like no 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 don't don't do that right don't cry mm -hmm. and then it just mm -hmm. gives you like these weird gaspy <gasps> things that right. are going on that ellen burston is doing right that yeah. um again i I, I yeah I don't know how I wouldn't begin to know how to artificially um, make my body do this kind of thing. This is from mm -hmm. like the sympathetic nervous system. This isn't things yeah, that yeah. you are usually able to turn on and off. Yeah, I did like I can't possibly imagine like other than actually feeling that way. Right. Like like I I would I would have to I would have to somehow work myself up to that mm -hmm. state and like and then like immediately turn around and try to stop it right yeah you'd have to yeah. actually be experiencing something emotional right um right and uh like blushing right you can't right make yourself blush on cue you have to put no. yourself in that position and yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't tell the producer yeah i can make myself blush <laughs> and then we all get mm. there and like we're just waiting for you to blush you're waiting for right. you to get embarrassed yeah and they're all watching you and you, you're real embarrassed and then it happens <laughs> Right. So the way to blush on camera, you're saying, is to is to try your hardest to blush and then and then not be able to do and it. And then fail. And then <laughs> and then you'll be real embarrassed. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that that's fine. If I if a producer's like, we need you to fail on camera. I'm like, well, I have that down. I got, you know, hey, hey, <laughs> you come to I the right two, guy. three times on the way here. <laughs> 
Um, but we yeah, need so, you to be a total yeah. embarrassment of mankind. <laughs> <laughs> Got it, fam. Just, <laughs> just like the lowest of the low. Like think, think, do, like, like, have you ever listened to podcasts? <laughs> No, ill. You know, those <laughs> those guys, you know, like imagine you have a podcast. Gross. <laughs> oh no, no, no. You're you're crying now. You're not supposed to cry. <laughs> no, I wanted you to blush with shame. Okay, all right. Well. Okay, well. Yeah. Whatever that is, that's what we got. Mm-hmm. So it's going in the picture. Yeah. Print it, boys. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> But yeah, all that said, I I really love uh, Ellen Burstyn's performance here. Mm-hmm. Um, now we cut just as Marin has turned away, but not after giving Chris all of his attention. Did you notice that, folks? Mm-hmm. Like as she you know struggles with that sob, like he's he's there for that. He's he's supporting her as she's trying to like you know do that hard reset and get yeah. back you know uh, you know under control and ministering um, to her, right? Y- Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, so not just, you know, yeah. Like, like comforting her, like, like being, you know, a shoulder just in case, you know, uh, you know, that cry does come out. Right. Now, before we go in this room, I think that mm. um, one of the things that I've been focusing on in, in some of my classes recently, my writing classes and my studies classes at UNLV film is the advice that my, um, my mentor, Mark May, uh, the screenwriter gave me, which is that um, movies sometimes will train you to know when they are ending Mm. and that helps us go like okay here comes the end of the movie right and it like gets right. us excited about it not just like you know oh there's half an hour left so your meter is going to be okay or anything right, like right. that but like we're assuming you're not looking down at the <laughs> right time stamp. right exactly but like that's why my other um my other screenwriting mentor hal alckerman would talk about the auspicious occasion we talked about a little bit right like hey we're yeah. all getting working towards the end of this movie is going to be the end of senior year it's going to be graduation right the end of this mm-hmm. movie is going to be the um the anniversary party we've all been getting ready for, or, you know, um, the big game or the big fight, right. in Rocky. So like, I, exactly, so yeah. I think we understand that, that this moment that's about to happen with Marin, who now we understand is the exorcist, right. Mm-hmm. That once Marin enters that room, this is it. Like this is the end right. of the movie. So it just, yeah. it just, you know, without them having to say it, you know, he doesn't have to say that. Like mm-hmm. once I go in this room, this will be the end of the movie, either right. positively or negatively, things will be resolved. Mm-hmm. Maybe you get a little denim at the end of an tie, you know, strings. Right. But this Something. is it. And then, then Demi turns to him and is like, it's like, will, will there be any like a uh, falling action father? <laughs> And Marin looks at him. He's like, and he's trying to decide mm-hmm. what to say. <laughs> and, and, and he says, "There will be only one." <laughs> hmm. But yeah, but yeah. Okay, so folks, yeah, this is it. This is the the beginning of the end. This is the beginning of the exorcism and the beginning of the end of this movie. Mm-hmm. So from outside, we cut. And we are now in the room. It's a dramatic switch from warm colors to cold. Mm-hmm. The demon's moaning is also louder in here, right? And that's something like like it's been all throughout this minute. I don't think we mentioned it in the uh, uh, at the top of this minute, but like it's been uh, um, uh, present this entire minute. Mm-hmm. But now it's we are in the place where it is coming from. Um, so. Marin opens the door, and we can see that his eyes go immediately to Reagan slash Howdy. Mm-hmm. Um, we also see that stone crack again as he looks at her. And I can interpret this in two ways. Knowing how compassionate Marin is, he could be seeing Reagan's wasted frame, seeing what Howdy has done to her, and that's what's cracking his his stone. But Looking at his eyes, I also wondered, could it be fear? We talked before about how we don't think Marin's uh, shaking from earlier was uh, was out of fear. But now, could it be that, yes, Marin is the stronger priest. Yes, he is mentally, emotionally, and spiritually stronger and more prepared than anyone else in this house. He has the experience, but even so, he is a human looking at a demon. He is looking at the the great question. He is looking at eternity. And maybe we haven't seen Damien react this way because he still doesn't believe. He still doesn't know what he's looking at. Um, if I remember correctly, I think we're going to get that look from him soon. Mm-hmm. But right now, it's Marin's turn to 
Behold the Unspeakable. If I'm reading his face correctly, what do you think? I Kenan? think you're right, because as we go on further in this, we do see moments where, I mean, you can only read it as Marin being afraid. Mm. And, you know, to intellectualize where he is strong, he's, but, yeah. but, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, if, if you go on like the the Tower of Terror or the Gardens of the Galaxy right now, mm-hmm, like even mm-hmm. if you're a big tough guy, you know, it, right. your body just reacts and so you, they just yeah. drop you ten stories mm-hmm. or whatever. And you, yeah. you know, it, it's almost impossible for you to be like stealing yourself and to be that alabaster statue, right? Right. right. So even I mean, if he's he, mentally prepared, but like just to see what's happening in front of him, I think that yeah. that that must get him. Yeah, I mean, he could be he could be you know the 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 strongest, most faithful. Um, you know, most spiritually able mm-hmm. human on earth, and he's still a human looking at something beyond human can. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, if you if you tickle Terry Crews or or, <laughs> or, or the rock or, you know, I don't know where you're going with this. You know, they're still going to react. It's, you know, it's not like they could be sure. tough mentally, physically, et cetera, but they're still going to yeah. go, <laughs> right? Exactly. And it's right? not like, oh, oh, you know, I, it's not some. Oh look, I'm so special! I scared Terry Crews or it scared uh, the Rock or whatever. It's just like there's a physical, a physiology to the reaction that is just going to happen. Yeah, and it could be. I mean, you know that that he's doing his own kind of like bit of uh, you know hard reset. That you know, same as uh, as Chris was doing mm. out there mm-hmm. with with her cry, right? Like there could be like a lot of stuff going on behind his eyes. It could be. It could be both. It could be the the pity for Reagan seeing her her as she is, right? And then maybe maybe like a remembering. Maybe it's like like maybe he blocked out what it was like to to be in the presence of howdy and right. now it's like oh did like i remember this you might have to in order to survive in order to go yeah. on a train trip in order to read a book uh, you know mm-hmm, to, mm-hmm. to do the crossword puzzle you might have to block those things out yeah yeah but he, you know, we have a uh, slight change right from the book where he has gone and seen her at this point right right he has already he has already gone in there mm-hmm. um uh we don't we are not privy to that uh conversation right um but yeah he he goes in there he closes the door Mm -hmm. the demon begins laughing hysterically and then he's hurrying out the door and down the stairs again right um and and up upstairs uh uh, Sharon opens the door and she was in there like I guess the same way that Carl's in there now just kind of like you know tending to Reagan mm-hmm. and making sure everything's okay right but and I think we actually skipped past it in the book but Sharon does reveal what uh, what went on in there mm-hmm. and basically what happened was Marin went in he and the demon looked at each other mm-hmm. and then Howdy said this time you're going to lose mm-hmm. And, you know, then he starts laughing and then, you know, Marin leaves. Mm-hmm. And Sharon says this to Chris and she can't, you know, make out what it means and neither can Sharon. And uh, Sharon just kind of is like, oh, it's so funny. And and Chris actually gets irritated. It's like he's like because Sharon has in the telling of the story, she has said the word funny like right. like 10 times. And she's like, can you think of another word? Right. <laughs> Right. So for movie Marin, this is the first time he's gone into this room. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. So he hasn't. So we don't have kind of a, a preamble where he sees the, the demon um, and then goes out and gets ready. He's gotten ready. Right. This is the first time. Right. Yeah. And yeah. then, yes, in the script as well, we also have Carl in here in this heavy hunting jacket and all of really that. yeah yeah <laughs> interesting <laughs> right so that's there so Vladdy was holding mm. on to that idea at until some point in the production well okay so what do you what do you think of uh of these choices i personally like because you know it, i mean listeners know like i i really like the book but mm. i'm actually thankful that he took carl out of the room mm-hmm. and also that we didn't have that uh little meeting between howdy and Marin. i i like that this is the first time right it's just more dramatic again not dramatic in just the sense of you know an art that you see with characters with actors right so yeah not not saying that that's um wrong for the book necessarily but for mm-hmm. the movie mm-hmm. version right this is more dramatic yeah and with with Marin and karis going through this door it's almost like we're seeing Reagan for the first time again. It's right. like we get to have that shock again, even though we've already seen her. We've we've seen her like change. We've seen every stage of her changing, but this is still like a like, <gasps> mm-hmm. you know. So we don't have um, Carl being there, and then no. Marin Marin coming in, and Carl is like, "That's just her face. <laughs> That's just the way <laughs> she looks." <laughs> and Marin's like, "Oh." oh. <laughs> 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 
We're not. We're not asking you to to fix any of that. That's just. Uh, <laughs> it's just. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> just have her. Have her stop saying. <laughs> Swear cunt. words, right? Yeah. Right. She says "cunt" too often, Father. Yeah. <laughs> Please have her stop speaking in in Burke's voice. Please. <laughs> so yeah. In in any case. So okay. So we're in that room. Marin has just entered, and now he's looking. At we don't even see we just see him looking mm-hmm. uh, at Reagan, um, but Damien comes in behind Marin, and we can't see his face. Right. It's still in shadow, um, but we can see that first exhalation of breath by Marin, which means that this room is freezing. We cut briefly to a shot of the bed where we see Reagan for the. I know we said. Like the, this is the, this is like our first time seeing her because we're following Marin mm-hmm. in, but also just like in the movie we haven't seen her for quite a while. Um, I know we had those overlays a few minutes ago, but mm. this is our first time being physically back in the room with her since uh, Sharon. Yeah, watch out for Sharon. Ah, watch out for Sharon. <laughs> but no, like that's the scene. It's right uh, after he would have had that dream with you know Father Lucas yeah. is when he goes over and he sees wor- the words help me written on her stomach. That was the last time we saw her. That feels like forever ago. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. And even then she was asleep. And actually the last time we were in the room with her and she was awake was what an excellent day for an exorcism. Mm-hmm. Wow. And it also might feel long for us, you know, partly because we're doing it this way minute by minute, but that, and also Keenan, that episode was recorded before the strike. So for us, <laughs> like, like, like maybe it just feels really, really long for us, but like, yeah, what an excellent day for an exorcism was the last time we talked to Reagan. Well, geez, but that is, that is like 20 minutes ago. So that is quite a big chunk. Yeah. yeah. In any case, um, I like what the camera does here. We're seeing Reagan again, uh, for the first time Reagan is in the bed and she is seething. You can see her chest going up and down. She's snarling and the camera backs away and it becomes an over the shoulder shot as we hide behind Marin and Karis. It's like the camera is afraid of Reagan. Yeah. It's this crazy thing, right? Because we think, okay, if I want, if they're coming into the room and I'm trying to emphasize mm-hmm. What Marin is seeing and how terrible it is, right? Maybe I would yeah. move the camera towards Reagan, right? Right, like, right. But instead, we do the opposite, yeah. Which is, um, it still has that same feeling counterintuitively that, like, uh oh. Right. But yeah, it becomes over the shoulders. These two men who are giant in the frame, right? Just by the mm-hmm, nature of mm-hmm. having an over the shoulder camera that close to them, and she right, becomes right. smaller, but she does not feel less powerful at all. No, 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 absolutely not. Right. No. And we can see now that she is looking directly at Marin. Um. I always forget the yellow blanket. Right. Like I know it's I know it's like part of the whole like set piece. I don't know why I always forget about it. Maybe because it's like such a contrast to all the the like the blacks and the blues and the purples and the greens that we got mm-hmm. going on in here. Um plus the atmosphere of the room sort of like like infects it and makes it a little green. Yeah, and also it's the same yellow blanket we've seen in the room back in her happy days. Um, oh. So I just really admire the work they've done here to stay consistent with what like the family would have on hand. We've talked about that with like Jerry rigging the bed to make right, it safer right. for her. But uh, but yeah, like th- this stuff that like oh we have around and. Yeah, in another movie that's not keeping track of that or one that wants it to be maybe less complicated, it would just right. be like, okay, we were getting rid of some of that stuff that we've had before and, and we're just assuming, you know, we're, we're not thinking about it, but, uh, you know, that the help is going out and just buying all new clothes for everybody all the time. Right, right. Like just disposing of like like these this, this bedding and stuff like that and just getting new ones, right? right? <laughs> so it's just random like, like uh, patterns of blankets and stuff like that. Yeah, right? you hear rumors sometimes, I don't know. I won't mention the name of the actor that I've heard do this, but mm. but uh, that she had it in her contract that um, she would get to keep all the clothes. So huh. so then she would argue. I get. I don't know if this is true, and I guess I'm not saying her name. So, but the the, mm. the story of it is that she would argue with the director and say like, "No, my character needs to change clothes," mm. <laughs> and they're just like, "I don't I don't know understanding where this is coming from." Yeah. <laughs> and it turned out it's because the actor wanted just to keep every single costume <laughs> that the character was wearing. <laughs> I like she does like three different um three different looks for each story day. Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like with this blanket here, Keenan, um, it makes me it like it it almost makes me want to like make up a little story for this blanket. Mm-hmm. This could be like like Reagan's I don't know, comfort blanket or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why it's sticking around. Like even, even now, even in this, like, it's this like bright little patch of sunlight in this, in this really, really dark place. It's like, like maybe Sharon or Chris is like, maybe this will help or something, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, we we cut back. It's the same shot of the two priests at the door, and Marin gets right to work. He turns, and we follow him as he makes his way to the far end of the room. His lips are in a thin line. He's holding something like we see, like uh, this little red thing. Um, but yeah, it's like uh, like his lips are a thin line on his thin face. Mm-hmm. Um, now we cut to Dimmy, and we can catch just a glimpse of his face as he turns to close the door, and he looks like he is already in trouble. Um, part of it might be, you know, the cold, but again, just the, like the juxtaposition here, like we, we had a shot a few seconds ago where Marin was like taken aback and, you know, maybe saw like what fear looked like on Marin's face, right? Karis wears it a little bit differently. Um, on, on Marin, it almost looks noble. He, he looks like someone sculpted a statue of a fearful saint, mm-hmm. right? Like beholding something, you know, beyond his ken. Right. Car- yeah. Karis looks more like how we would look, right? <laughs> his, his his eyes are big. His head is down, chin to chest. His his mouth is stretched in this like open frown. We can see his teeth. We can see this for just enough time to register like the difference between how the two priests have come into this room. Mm-hmm. Um, so ju- he's doing what we would uh, be doing, you're saying. So you think he's pissing himself right now? And- uh, oh, yeah, right. Like just like... <laughs> That's how I would play it if I was Jason Miller. I just had uh-huh. piss going down my my <laughs> leg. <laughs> That's why Carl's in there. Like he's got he's got all the. That's right. He's got the sw- all the bedding, all the rubber bands, yeah. All that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> but no, I think I think I think we're like in this situation. Like we're closer to Karis. Right? Absolutely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if I'd stay in. I said, right, exactly. I, I'd turn around and like, like you know, in the in the in the frame where he's like supposed to close the doors, you just rip and then he's gone. <laughs> oh god, is that one of the parodies we saw where the priest just jumps directly yes. out of the window? <laughs> oh no, <laughs> it was um. Well, no, no, no. It was a. Uh, I think it was scary movie too. It was, it was, um, yeah, I think so. But no, no, no. It was a. Uh, it was James Woods mm-hmm. and and he, but he was Marin and right. like he comes in and he's like, oh fuck this, and, and he turns to go. <laughs> right. Uh, that would be us, folks. Mm-hmm, that would be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I still love the the juxtaposition between how Marin and Karis handle this fear. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, yeah, so Dimi turns and he closes the door. But uh, before it closes, we get a close up of Chris. Mm-hmm. Um, in half a second, the door is going to move in front of the camera, and we realize she is being shut out. But Keenan, before that happens, what is this look that she has given us? Is this is this a continuation of the pleading look she was giving Marin, right? Like she's like, please, please help her. Is she looking after them as they enter? Um, is this a look of shock that Karis is closing the door on her, right? And like trying not to, you know, let let the book, you know, uh, influence us. Like, what do you think? It is really interesting how she seems to be able to be herself in front of Karis in a way that she can't with Marin necessarily. Right. Yeah. Like, like, okay, I'm trying to be brave for, for daddy, right. For daddy Marin as he comes in and, and like, we're going to have this noble talk there. And then once he's Mm -hmm. out of the room and it's just them again, it's just like, Oh geez, like all you know, all this you know, right? Like, uh-huh, like all yeah, the stuff yeah, I've yeah. been talking to you about. Also, we we've been mm-hmm, sharing mm-hmm. with the other, like you know, you know what I'm feeling about this, and like what are you yeah, feeling yeah. about this? And then he's trying to, yeah, close the door on her. I think even just metaphorically, like he has to like soldier up. You know, she has to. Right. She's she's demand making this emotional demand of him. Like I'm scared out of my mind. Are you scared out of your mind? And he right. is obviously, but when this look yeah. with her, he's gonna not not give it back to her. Yeah. And close right. Her. This the, like he is he is. He is that firefighter who who needs to fight the fire. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it does look a lot like the shot from The Godfather, which has become an iconic shot, yeah. the way that we close mm-hmm. the door on Kay at the very end. I yeah. don't know if that is, uh, uh, you know, Friedkin and Owen Roisman must have seen The Godfather, obviously. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, yeah I, I think that that shot from The Godfather has become more iconic as it's come along, that now it's yeah. hard for me as like a film student to not see The Godfather here. Yeah. But I don't think it's like aping. I don't think it's on purpose where they're like, you remember no, the Godfather? Because no. that is no. about, um, that is the patriarchy at the end of the Godfather yes. closing the that door. Is, is the, like if ever there was a patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That is, at, at the end of both Godfather 1 and 2, the door closes on K and... Um, yeah, that's the patriarchy. So maybe our hashtag mm-hmm. not our Chris in 2023's extra sequel um, mm. forgot that she wasn't Diane Keaton. She thought she was in The Godfather. Like, <laughs> That's right. I was in a movie about God, and there were a couple of fathers. <laughs> right, and they were kissing his ring, and then, yeah. <laughs> and then I came back, and it, it was, 
it was I knew what you did, Kay. I knew it was right. you. You was you, was you my, broke my you heart. Broke my heart. He was my brother. <laughs> <laughs> And then that shark came out, and I said, "You, yeah. you're going to need a bigger boat." Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> they wouldn't buy me a bigger boat because of the patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. McNeil, do you know? Do you know what your daughter did <laughs> on this the day of my daughter's wedding day? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm going to make a covenant he can't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway. Um no, I I like your explanation mm-hmm. of it, uh Keenan. Um and maybe also she's sort of realizing, mm-hmm. oh, oh, he's closing the door. Mm-hmm. Like it's 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 really it's happening. Really it's happening, happening yeah. right now. Right. Um and yes, the the door passes in front of the camera closing mm-hmm. and shutting Chris out. Right. Uh, and and we also realize right then that we are now shut in we are now alone in this room mm-hmm. with these two priests this girl and this demon um this is uh a, you know the, the like the final fantasy metaphor we mm-hmm. did right this is this is like when your party like has dwindled down or been like singled out for like the, the final final battle right. right yeah and now there's only two right so so Karis turns back from the door and we see more of his face. His eyes go immediately to Reagan and they stay on her as he turns, as he makes his way to Marin, who is now by the bedside table. Um, the demon's moans have now been replaced by an eerie wheezing, mm-hmm. which sounds like it's coming out of several throats at once. Oh, you're right. That's that's mm. terrible. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Like just like just like I can appreciate it on a on a like uh, a design level, mm-hmm. I love I love that effect. Um, but yeah, the the next shot is very very dark, but it looks like we can make out hands, and we're right. Uh, Karis's hand reaches over and turns on the bedside lamp, and we can now also see what Marin was holding um, from a from a leather pouch. He takes out a golden crucifix, mm-hmm. and after kissing it gently. On the feet, he places it on the table. Mm -hmm. Uh, Next, he brings out a bottle of holy water. He undoes the stopper, and he begins to straighten up as we cut again. Yeah, this one, um, as if we're not sure if Damien was going to do the holy water bullshit again and fake it, right? This one, Mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. bottle looks like holy water, right? Like it's it's engraved, or I don't know what you would call it for glass, but yeah, it's like embossed or something, and it has a a cross on it, and it's got the the, like halo effect coming out, radiating out from the center of the cross. Like that's holy Mm -hmm. water. That is that is definitely holy. Right. I yeah. don't I don't think that he would have uh, you know emptied out uh, a vial of, <laughs> of this right. and then replaced tap water in it. Yeah. 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 Um, now we we cut and we are on the other side of that bed as Marin is continuing to straighten up, and that's when the demon finally chooses to speak. It says, "Stick your cock up her ass, you motherfucking worthless cocksucker." Lester, uh, it, it wasn't me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now this has got to be one of those lines that absolutely shocked people mm-hmm. back in the 70s, especially coming out of the character of this little girl, and especially if they thought it was Linda Blair saying it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, she was saying it, but they dubbed it over with uh, Mercedes. Right. But like, and I have to keep reminding myself that today this line doesn't shock us as much, particularly because of the success of this movie. Yeah. Um, like it's it's fame, it's notoriety for doing stuff like this. And then we got, you know, the parodies, which essentially like boil the movie down to its most shocking bits and exaggerate them even further. We like, we got to go back. We are in the theater in 1973. Divorce is a taboo subject in entertainment. And this demon, this girl has just said this unspeakable thing. And I actually misremembered this line until now. I thought Mercedes said, stick it up your ass. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, you know, more Beetlejuice potty humor from, from the <laughs> demon. But then I heard it here and I was like, oh, geez, that is not what she is saying at all. Yeah. And it's interesting, right? So the demon, uh, what, like admitting that that the demon and Reagan are two different people, right? And then like speaking the right. third, uh, the second person, no, the third second person third, the third well, person speaking referring to her reagan ass. in the third person yes her, yeah. <laughs> right right so so um that's just really interesting to me right mm-hmm. and then to, yeah you're completely right about how shocking this must have been so again like the rating system that allows swearing right because before that there was mm-hmm. you couldn't say you could say hell or damn or bastard but right. they had to be about 
you know, literal hell and literal damning and literal bastard. Right. You couldn't say those. You could say those lines, but not, you know. Yeah. Um, you could say bastard in a Shakespeare play. You could yeah. say hell, you know, if you were playing a priest. You know? <laughs> or like Maleficent would be able to say like all the powers right. of hell, you know, specifically. Right. Like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, but so so the rating system got to 1968 and then we started having movies where you could swear and, you know, they jump right in. Hollywood like makes movies that, mm. that have that. But but they were still relatively rare and they were pretty crazy. Um, and then the first time we used the F word is in mash in 1970, um, oh. which is a comedy. Um, mm, so, mm. you know, th- so to go from a comedy where someone, I forget exactly what happens during this football game in mash, but they're, they're losing, mm. you know, they're losing in the football game and they say, fuck, yeah. and it's an ad lib. Huh. And they're like, well, let's keep it in, see if it gets cut out and it doesn't get cut out. Yeah. So then three years, within three years of like losing a football game, ah, oh, fuck. We're out to, um, what is the line here? Uh, yeah, stick, stick your, your cock, cock up, her, up ass. her ass, you motherfucking you. worthless cocksucker! Right? Yeah. It's got the mm-hmm. iambic pentameter to it. Right? Stick yeah. your cock like up, up her up, ass, up, you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. So to go from that to that, it's... and now a haiku from <laughs> William Peter Blake. <laughs> right. It's that's quite a shock. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And like, okay. At the end of the day. It doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. It's just the demon saying stuff. In in fact, it almost seems desperate here. Yes. Keenan. Like, like he can't think of anything else to say. We just read the book. And Howdy was like, you know, he was still crude, but he was making these like um comparisons to, mm-hmm. you know, like uh holy water being like, you know, uh piss. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you know, you know, bend and fart clouds of in clouds of incense and you know, calling him Saint Marin and just, you know, being like really, really um sarcastic mm-hmm. about it. But here it's just like it's it's almost like he's like absolutely right yeah he's getting desperate like he's on the ropes i mean i know he's tied up literally (laughs) but like as he's feeling more on the ropes he gets he gets more animalistic right yeah um Mm. and so like the the foul mouth nature of it it's not like clever anymore Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it, it is like you know when a 13 year old boy starts to swear or, or maybe earlier exactly. and they start to learn these words and they just use them all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing also in the book is like, he's specifically going after Marin mm-hmm. and or the church, right? right? Like making all these like religious references um, and, you know, pairing them with these like blasphemous things. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and, you know, and, and he's calling out Marin's past sin, right. Of pride um, calls him proud scum. That's the first mm-hmm. thing he, he does. Right. Um, Saint Marin, we already said, mm-hmm. right. Very sarcastic, very disdainful of Marin. And that's not to say I don't like what they do with Howdy in the movie. Right. I actually think if they tried the book stuff in a film medium, it would seem goofy. That's the right word for it. Yeah. Yeah. I said in previous minutes, I think they're making movie howdy to be less human. And you just said more animalistic, mm-hmm. Keenan, like, like a malicious insect or a cancer that can talk. Mm. Right. And I think the simple, hateful crudity without all the big words makes him scarier for the movie. What was that quote? We were, we were quoting uh, Simone Vey in the bonus episodes. Right. Uh, we said, we said, um, um, Fictional evil is, you know, it's intoxicating, it's seductive, mm-hmm. but but real life evil is, it's gross and it's very crude mm-hmm. and it's it's uh, like boring in the sense yeah. that it's like it's not it's not desirable at all. It's just like ugh, get it away it's from me. It's banal, right? right? Yeah, right. Um, and that's what I'm what I'm reading from movie howdy here, right. and it's actually working. It's making it more real for me, right? Because I, I think that's what we want. Like he's he's like a swarm of wasps <laughs> that has learned how to talk, mm-hmm. right? Um, and all they can do, like they they don't have the words, right? They don't have you know the vocabulary of a Hannibal Lecter, right? They can they can just like, like fuck you, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, so even though they're a little bit different in their approaches, I think I think book howdy is perfect for the book, and Freed can make movie howdy perfect for the movie. What do you think? Yeah, that that goofiness idea is really apt. I'm thinking about, you know, I, uh, I hesitate to use our platform to, to criticize other people's work, you know, like mm-hmm. you know, uh, but like there's the Beauty and the Beast. Not, yeah, um, he's like, yeah, we would never do that on this show. <laughs> No, but I mean, like, you know, I, I hope we're doing it lovingly and not like yeah, you know, yeah. put, punching down because, you know, we haven't mm-hmm. made big movies, you know, but like there's right, that Beauty right. and the Beast uh, remake. And um, uh-huh. I don't know if you've seen that one, but uh, no, no. Yeah. People criticize Emma Watson's performance and I would 
I would defend her. I think she has an impossible task. Um, yeah, cause like yeah. what some people say is like, at, like that she seems sort of aloof from all of this stuff, all this magical stuff that's happening, you know, cause they're remembering mm-hmm. the original beauty and the beast, the, the Disney version. Right. And, and, yeah. Bella's like, oh, wide-eyed with wonder, how how wonderful all this stuff is, right? But like, sure. if you're a human being and you're not hiding behind a cartoon, like right. facade, and these dishes are dancing and talking about lick this gray stuff off of our dish asses, and you're like, <laughs> and you're like going, oh, la, 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 la. you just look ridiculous, like, like that's an impossible yeah. thing for them to ask her to do. So, right. so her, so her choice is to like put her hand on her on her chin and sort of like be like have a little smirk like isn't that interesting (laughs) which is just like i don't know how you how you would do it otherwise because otherwise yeah there are things that are appropriate for certain mediums and so when you're trying to do these adaptations into um into animation you can't do them one one to one like you cannot necessarily always do book one to one and say exactly what's in the book or exactly what's in the play because they're written they're classics in those mediums because they are perfectly suited for those mediums and those forms exactly yeah Yeah. no keenan i agree yeah any like any actor who is stepping into who is brave enough to step into the role of one of these Disney characters, right? <laughs> Specifically like, like, like one of these Disney princesses yeah. who already have a history and, and a following and a almost, almost a religious following. Oh yeah. Say, uh, right? absolutely. It's, it's one of those things. It's like, like Belle does this. She doesn't do mm, that. Right. right. Mulan does this. She doesn't do that. She looks like this. She says this. Right. right? And, and then to like put another character, like no matter how good of an actor you mm-hmm. are, it, it, like all the respect, all the praise to you, because like you're 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 fighting a battle right there. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. So I mean, can you imagine Linda Blair, you know, seeing Linda Blair being tied to this bed and and seeing right. this this bile come out of her and seeing these scratches on her face and and then yeah. have her say these paragraphs of um of insults? It's just not gonna work right from the book. It it just it, yeah. yeah, it would feel it, it would give the wrong idea. It wouldn't feel like she's a tight animal and she's desperate. It would feel like, oh, she has all of this strength and none of this matters, right? Like she's right. still above this and, and so this is just like any other day for her. Yeah, it would it it just wouldn't land the same way that Howdy's words land in the book mm-hmm. if you put them to film. Right. I like Friedkin's decision to to put the focus on how dangerous Howdy is right yeah. now. Yeah. And how like because he is so desperate. Right. But yeah, in any case, so Howdy is immediately shut down by Marin, right? Whatever whether he talks about, you know, farting clouds of incense or, <laughs> you know, sticking a cop up, you know, somebody's ass, mm-hmm. right? Whatever, right? Like both both book and uh movie Marin shut him down. And this is this is what I was talking about. We have this kindly old grandpa who has been so loving and so gentle. This is another thing that I think gets overlooked in this mixture of gentleness and strength. This sounds stupid, but this is something I strive for. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I, I go to the gym and I, I try to be as big as and strong as possible, but like I, I want to have that like in the service of protecting someone. I want to be selfless like this and have that strength be for someone else. Mm-hmm. And they don't got to worry because I will kick the ass of anyone who messes with them. I have their back. But you know, even me wanting that, there's a little bit of pride, mm-hmm. a little bit of ego, right? right? It's 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 this. But for Marin, it's this complete dissolution of ego. Like that's how he can command this demon with such authority. Like he's he's not hung up on his image. He's not worrying about how he sounds when he commands Howdy to be silent. Mm-hmm. He just shouts, be silent. And it's the first time grandpa has shouted and you're like, oh, right. Grandpa was in a war. <laughs> And rather than shock you, you actually like feel even safer because grandpa has, has command of this situation. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, okay. So this exchange happens over several cuts. We, we start on the other side of the bed, like I said, and then as Marin crosses himself, we cross to their side of the bed. And now it's like, we're like the third priest. Mm -hmm. Marin is unfazed at Howdy's remarks. Uh, he continues to cross himself and then makes the sign of the cross over Damien. Um, we cut over Marin's shoulder just as, uh, Marin is finishing his blessing and Howdy is finishing his curse. Mm -hmm. And only then does Marin acknowledge him even, right? Just shouting, be silent and sprinkling him with holy water to which Howdy immediately reacts. And you get the feeling, like you said, Keenan, 
this is real holy water, mm-hmm. right? And it really, really does burn him. Right. Yeah. No questions about that there. Right. He's not playing. He's not faking this time. So we cut and Marin is already back to work, right? Back to the ritual. He crosses himself again. Uh, then he turns and sprinkles Damien with holy water as he crosses himself, uh, as, as Damien crosses himself. Right. So him him sprinkling Damien uh, with holy mm. water, that comes directly out of the rite of exorcism in the Roman oh. ritual, which I was able to look up and see. So I don't mm-hmm. know what, uh, I don't know if, if I could find a copy of what it would have been in 1971 and 73. Right. So let me just read the entire uh, beginning of the Rite of Exorcism in the Rome Mm. ritual now. Um, Mm. I'm finding my version at catholic.org. The priest delegated by the ordinary to perform this office should first go to confession, or at least elicit an act of contrition, and if convenient, Mm. offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass and implore God's help in other fervent prayers. He vests Mm. in surplus and purple stole. Having before him the possessed person, who should be bound if there is any danger, he traces the sign of the cross over him, over himself and the bystanders, and then sprinkles all of them with holy water. After this, he kneels and says the litany of the saints, exclusive of the prayers which follow it. All present are to make the responses. So I think that's really interesting that, yeah, so yeah. If, if you're in the room, you are a participant. So it's audience right. participation. You don't get to be a fly mm-hmm. on the wall when you're watching them yeah. at Susigol and just, uh, you know, <laughs> just be like, oh, it's so dumb that they're doing this calm response thing. You have to do it, um, right. which is going to come into, into play textually uh, in our next couple of minutes. But yes. yeah, so he's sprinkling the holy water and everybody who's in the room. Right. So, so Demi, like, like. Whatever we thought, Dimi is in it now. Right? <laughs> right. Yes. And while he is doing that, we can hear eerie moans rising up from the bed and filling the room. Folks, the exorcism has officially begun. There is no turning back now. Sadly, that is all of my notes for this minute. Join us next week as we dive into the actual exorcism of the exorcist. For now, that is all of my notes. Keenan, is there anything else? No, I think we got it. All right. Folks, this has been another excellent Exorcist Minute. I've been Lester Ryan Clark. You can reach me on all the socials as Lester Ryan Clark. And I've been Keenan Diaz. You can find me on Instagram and Letterbox at Howdy Keenan. Yeah, we got our listener group, Compelling Conversations. Go check that out and request to join, and we'll let you in here with us. Thank you so much to everyone who has shared the show by word of mouth or on a, uh, social media. And a big thank you to everyone who has given us a five star ratings on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to our show. It's, well, we really appreciate it. It's going to help our little podcast grow and find more cool people like you. All right, Keenan. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? I think I am, Lester. Folks, until next time, the the power power of of Justin Justin Bieber's Bieber's monkey monkey compels compels you. It's quite a phrase. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's like our cellar door. Like that was Tolkien's like idea of like this perfect line, right? Oh, In yeah. English, cellar door, cellar yeah. door. Justin Bieber's, Justin Bieber's monkey. monkey. <laughs> Justin Bieber's monkey. <laughs> <laughs> You know, in, in 200 years, it'll become an expli- what's explicative, right? Instead of people like, Jesus Christ, they'll be like, Justin Bieber's monkey. <laughs> Once when I was working as a cashier. Justin H. Bieber's monkey. (laughs) On a bicycle. (laughs) On a bicycle. With all the saints. Once when I was working as a cashier, this was like height of Bieber fever. Uh And there was like this little girl, like she was three, like she could barely talk. Uh And, um... And she's looking at the tabloids, you know, the magazines, mm-hmm. and she's like, Mom, Dad, Justin Bieber, Justin Bieber, and like throwing a fit. Aww. And they and they turn to me and just, she loves Justin Bieber. And they're so embarrassed. Like, we don't know who told her who that was. <laughs> <laughs> I love Justin Bieber. She, how did she know? She's three. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're like, we didn't tell her about Justin Bieber. We wouldn't do that. <laughs> Mom, Dad, the sun also rises. <laughs> it's a great American novel. That's right. <laughs> the Godfather. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Bieber song titles. So yeah, they 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 go in there and and, mm-hmm. and Marin starts saying the prayer to Maria. <laughs> And, and, and Karis is like, what do you mean? And Father Marin's like, hold on. 
and and he goes over to 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 Reagan. It's like, hey, um, what's the matter? Are you lonely? Because you're my favorite girl. And then and then uh, Howdy points to Karis and he says, "That should be me." <laughs> Um, but, uh, and then, and then Reagan's like, like, but unfortunately I'm stuck with you. <laughs> I've run out of Justin Bieber knowledge, Lester. I'm going <laughs> to warn you about that now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and, oh, and there's an album called Holy. I just, I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> but just, you know, just do with that what you will. There you go.